We are going to look at five key concepts in evolutionary thinking, the first of which is natural selection. Natural selection presents us with a puzzle because it creates the appearance of a design without having a design in mind or even having a mind at all. There is no agent that's actively selecting anything. How does it do that? Natural selection occurs whenever these four necessary conditions are fulfilled. First, there's variation in reproductive success. Second, there's variation in the trait of interest. Third, there's a non-zero correlation between reproductive success and the trait. And fourth, the state of the trait is heritable. There's genetic variation for the trait. When in doubt, return to these basic conditions. They help you to understand whether or not natural selection could be operating on anything. Let's unpack them. First, variation in reproductive success. Now, to a first approximation, in humans, this is variation in completed family size, and that means lifetime reproductive success, abbreviated LRS, or children ever born, abbreviated CEB. In bacteria and cancer cells, it's variation in time and survival between cell divisions. Now, to reproduce, one must survive, of course. Thus, reproductive success is a composite of survival and reproduction. The probability of surviving to reproduce times the number of offspring produced, summed over the reproductive period. Now, you'll note that selection acts directly via reproductive success and only indirectly via survival to the extent that survival is contributing to reproductive success. This is an important point and it's because of this distinction that we can see how aging evolves. Now, variation in reproductive success is universal. We have two examples here. On the top panel we have the monogamous Pitcairn Islanders and in the bottom panel the polygynous Dogon in Mali. Males are in blue, females are in red. On the x-axis, we have the number of offspring that a particular individual had. On the y-axis, we have the number of people who had that number of offspring. And you can see that in both populations, there's great variation in reproductive success. Any trait that correlates with reproductive success in these populations will experience selection. And whether it then responds to selection is going to depend on whether it is heritable, on whether it's underpinned by genetic variation. Variation in the trait is then the, another key factor. The trait could be anything. It could be eye color, height, the temperature dependence of an enzymatic reaction, the structure of the ribosome, susceptibility to a disease. Those are all possible traits that could be under selection. If the trait does not vary, there can be no competition for improved reproductive performance among trait variants. Natural selection does not operate on things that do not vary. Now, most traits do vary among individuals, and most traits, therefore, can potentially come under selection. Here's an example, variation in resistance to malaria. Here you have a table of sickle cell genotypes across sub-Saharan Africa. There are 10 rows, each for a different region of Africa. These two columns show the infected and uninfected people that have the S allele, the sickle allele. And these two columns show the infected and uninfected people who are AA homozygotes. So S codes for sickle cell and A is for the normal hemoglobin. You can see down here at the bottom the percentage of people infected and if you examine those, you'll see that the sickle cell carriers were about 6% less likely to be infected by malaria than the normal homozygotes. Now, the SS homozygotes suffer from anemia. The AA homozygotes suffer from malaria. And the SA heterozygotes are protected from malaria. So this is an example where genetic variation is being maintained in these populations by the selection pressure ex exerted by disease. 
In this case, we have a lot of information on the biochemical basis. The S variant is caused by a mutation in the sixth position of the beta globin chain of hemoglobin, and that results in the replacement of hydrophilic glutamic acid by hydrophobic valine. So here is a case in which we can go right from the molecular level up to the population level to understand why genetic variation is being maintained in the population. And we can also see that disease is playing an important role in selection on humans. The next criterion, the next condition, is that the correlation between reproductive success and the trait of interest must be non-zero. Even if there's variation in reproductive success and variation in the trait, that doesn't mean that natural selection is operating. Those are necessary conditions, but they are not yet sufficient. There must also be a correlation between the value of the trait and reproductive success. For example, patients who resist disease may reproduce more often than patients who don't. What in general generates such correlations? Well, they are produced by myriad circumstances in the biology of humans and also in their culture. An important element of human culture is now medicine. Medicine is actually generating correlations between reproductive success and traits of interest. There is thus no single general cause of selection. Selection occurs for a huge variety of reasons that include anything that causes variation in reproductive success. Let's take a look at one example. Here is a table of uh, traits with are correlated, that are correlated with reproductive success, and they come from women in Framingham, Massachusetts, born between 1890 and 1960. The traits are cholesterol, height, weight, age at first birth, and age at menopause. This beta is not, strictly speaking, a correlation coefficient. It is a selection gradient, and it has the same sign as a correlation coefficient. You can see that the sample sizes are large, the p-values are small, these are all significant effects. What we can see from this table is that in this period, for women in Framingham, selection was acting to decrease their total cholesterol, to decrease their height, to increase their weight, to decrease their age at first birth, and to increase their age at menopause. So selection is acting in a contemporary human population, and this result is fairly general. It's been confirmed in other populations as well. The next necessary condition is that the state of the trait must be heritable. That is the critical genetic condition that allows what worked in the past to be remembered and improvements to accumulate. It thus interacts with natural selection to generate order out of disorder. However, inheritance must not be 100% perfect. If it were, genetic variation could not originate in the first place and if for some reason it already existed, then natural selection would rapidly eliminate it by selecting the best variants. There has to be some mutation to create the, mut the variation that's the fuel on which the motor selection runs, but not so much mutation that it destroys too much of the useful information on what worked in the past. So there must be some intermediate, fairly low, optimal mutation rate. Here are the heritabilities of some human traits. Age at first birth, 0.11. Blood traits like cholesterol, somewhere around 0.4, 0.3, 0.4. .4. Age at menopause, about 0.6. Height, about 0.75. And all of these traits are capable of responding to selection, but height will respond more rapidly than age at first birth because its heritability is higher. For an equivalent selection pressure, that means that height will respond more rapidly than age at first birth. Now, heritabilities are things that can vary from zero to one. Zero means no more resemblance between relatives than between people chosen at random. And one means that offspring have exactly the same value as the average of their parents. So, Human traits have significant genetic variation and can respond to selection. 
Let's take a look at natural selection in action. The rapid evolution of antibiotic resistance in Staphylococcus is illustrated by what is pretty much a standard history of introducing new drugs to combat bacterial infection. In 1943, penicillin became commercially available and Staphylococcus was resistant by 1947. There was a switch to methicillin in the 60s. Methicillin resistance was rising by the 80s. By the 1990s, 35% of isolates were resistant to methicillin. There was then a switch to vancomycin. By 1996, vancomycin resistance was reported and linozolid was approved in 2000 by the FDA and by 2002, linozolid resistance was reported in Staphylococcus. This is a fairly representative standard history of the way that bacteria respond to the introduction of antibiotics. They repeatedly re evolve resistance. It's caused by strong selection that elicits a rapid response. Bacterial populations are huge. There are large numbers of genetic variants that are continually generated by mutation, but also importantly introduced by horizontal gene transfer and generation times are, are very short. Antibiotic therapy creates huge differences in the reproductive success of different variants in the bacterial population. The trait that varies is resistance. That variation has a genetic basis. Antibiotics select resistant clones, which then have greater reproductive success. There are other examples of natural selection in clinical medicine and in public health. The evolution of metastatic cancer involves natural selection. The evolution of resistance to cancer chemotherapy involves natural selection. The coevolution of pathogens with host defenses leading to evasion and to manipulation involves natural selection. The evolution of pathogen virulence in response to changes in transmission and to vaccination campaigns involves natural selection. And the impacts of medical practice on human pathogen and cancer evolution all involve natural selection. So to summarize, selection occurs whenever variation in a trait is correlated with reproductive success. Traits experience selection only respond if their variation is heritable. Selection produces a significant response when the events that generate it occur frequently and consistently. Selection efficiently creates order out of disorder, producing the appearance of design that we call adaptation. No agent is actively selecting. The process emerges unsupervised from any circumstances that correlate heritable variation in traits with reproductive success. Natural selection is largely a numbers game. It occurs in response to things that happen frequently and consistently. First, variation in reproductive success. Now, to a first approximation, in humans, this is variation in completed family size, and that means lifetime reproductive success, abbreviated LRS, or, and fourth, the state of the trait is heritable. There's genetic variation for the trait. When in doubt, return to these basic conditions. They help you to understand whether or not natural selection could be operating on anything. Let's unpack them. First, there's variation in reproductive success. Second, there's variation in the trait of interest. Third, there's a non-zero correlation between reproductive success and the trait. We are going to look at five key concepts in evolutionary thinking, the first of which is natural selection. Natural selection presents us with a puzzle because it creates the appearance of a design without having a design in mind or even having a mind at all. There is no agent that's actively selecting anything. How does it do that? Natural selection occurs whenever these four necessary conditions are fulfilled. 